Good day. Welcome to our noon lecture. Um, I'm Paul Gladder. I'm a professor of journalism and director of the McCandless Phillips Journalism Institute. And I woke up this morning thinking about IBM, IBM Corporation, their ad campaign in the mid-90s. It was one word, think. And then in 1997, Apple came out with a new one of, called Think Different, which is a direct attack on IBM. So I, for some reason, I woke up thinking about that today because I was thinking of how to describe our speaker today. And I realized, you know what? It'd be a good retort, a two-word retort to Apple's campaign, Roberta Amundsen. <laughs> so um, why? Because Roberta is a person who uh, thinks differently, in my view. She's a person who sees things other people don't tend to not see, uh, to make connections that other people often don't make. And I think that's something we value at King's. And she makes these connections in journalism, and I'm, we're very thankful for that. And she also makes these connections in art. She's a writer. She started her career as a, as a teacher, as a journalist, and has extended her career while continuing those things as, an, as a philanthropist, an art collector, and someone who makes lots of interesting connections. So she's often here talking with our students about journalism, and today I'm really pleased we can also hear her uh, she's talking this evening about journalism, by the way, Central Presbyterian, which I hope you got that invitation as well. But at noon today, we're going to hear her talk about something uh, different on our campus, which is her views of art and beauty. So um, there'll be time for Q&A at the end. I'm told to ask people to line up at a microphone. Where is that going to be? Right here. Okay, so please line up at the microphone if you have a question. Without further ado, let's welcome Roberta Amundsen. Thank you. Thanks for coming. You never know if anyone will show up or not, but here you are, so thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. These are always lower and I'm higher. Anyway, um, beauty is a subject that has been much out of favor for decades, but it is beginning to get a hearing once again. Though I didn't think it is, though I don't think it is necessary to good art, which is uh, a confusion, I think, that um, some people make. I do think beauty is necessary to a good life. And in the next few minutes, I aim to tell you why. You never know where you'll get the lead for a talk like this. And this one comes from a chat I had at a memorial service, uh, well, with a chat I had with someone I only see at memorial services, weddings, or, or uh, odd gatherings back in Iowa. Um, because he's the brother-in-law of a friend of mine um, that I grew up with. And I also grew up with his wife, but she was a lot younger than me, so I didn't know her as well. And um, I was in Arizona for the memorial of my friend's, my friend's wife, who died this year. And, and, <laughs> and this, this guy's name is Jim, and he, he's a very blunt kind of person. He came up to me and he said, so what are you doing now? And, uh, and I said, well, I'm, I'm trying to write this book. And it sort of has to do with beauty, and it's about why we need beauty. But it's really about the longing for the New Jerusalem and how, what beauty has to do with that. And he said, why do we need beauty? Because there's so much ugly. And I thought, yeah, OK, I'll start with that. So there you are. Why do we need beauty? Because there's so much ugly. we got to have something else. So. Simple to the point. Um, we need beauty, and, and so it is there. Yet the Bible suggests another reason beauty is there. Psalm 145 puts it this way. I'm going to hold this up. I hope it's not distracting to you. But um, I, I write my speeches because if I didn't write them, I'd be talking for two hours. <laughs> um, I have the gift of the bunny trail. Anyway, and, uh, and so I write them. I was a writer first before I was a speaker. So um, here's Psalm 145. The Lord is loving unto all, and his mercies are over all his works. All thy works praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints give thanks unto thee. They show the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power, that thy power, thy glory, and the mightiness of thy kingdom might be known. That's what beauty does. The one big reason it matters, it tells us who God is. Nevertheless, 
Today, beauty is one of those contested words. Recent thinking in the art world has largely been that beauty is a bad word up there with creativity. The beauty industry, together with Hollywood images and the art market, gives us a superficial example of what the word means. And then there's the rest of us who kind of like the word, but aren't sure how and when to use it. Advertisers know all this, and being the unscrupulous folk that some of them are, they use our uncertainty and our longing to make a sale. And when I'm at home in California, I regularly walk past an Ace Hardware store, which for the past few years, and I was trying to count up in my head how long that thing's been up there, it must be five or six years now, and it has this message plastered in its window. A desire to nurture, a passion to create, a longing for beauty. Our tools are your inspiration. <laughs> we look at that ad and we know deep inside that this advertiser has tapped into something embedded in the human soul, our soul, whether we know how to talk about it or not. Our culture is shot through with examples of how pervasive this longing is. The art market is booming. The Art Market 2018, a report produced by Art Basel and USB, said, reported that sales reached $634.7 billion in 2017, which was up 12% from 2016. The three largest markets are the United States at 42%, China at 21, and the United Kingdom at 20. Dealer sales, 46% of which are done at art fairs now, are accounted for 33.7 billion, while the Wall Street Journal reported that spring sales at the three largest auction houses, and I vetted this with a friend who's a, a, the art reporter for the Wall Street Journal, this would be Sotheby's, Christie's, and, and Phillips, brought in 2.8 billion. In addition, there's the beauty culture, right? Skincare, makeup, fragrance, hair, weight loss, tanning, fashion, exercise is thriving. In March of this year, Orbis Research reported that the global cosmetics products market was valued at $532.4 billion, if you're looking for the business to go into, and expected to rise to a market value of eight. Oh, 5.6 billion by 2023. But none of those indicators really tell us why beauty matters. All they tell us is the power of the quest for this indefinable thing that we long for. In 1882, in an interview right here in this city with the New York Evening Post, one of the people who I find most interesting in history, Oscar Wilde, whose own life is a litany of unfulfilled longing, said this to the reporter, man is hungry for beauty, therefore he must be filled. There is a void, nature will fill it. So let's consider what beauty is and why it may matter. Before that, I need to make a distinction, clarify. This is not a talk about why art matters. Beauty and art, contrary to some people's thinking, are not the same thing. Art is a two- and three-dimensional, multi-sensory visual language. It can be beautiful, but it doesn't need to be beautiful to be good art. What it needs to do is to communicate well, to tell the truth. There are times, I would argue, when art needs to be beautiful, but certainly not all the time, and only when appropriate. Beauty is something else altogether. Ugly may even be a part of beauty. To, 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 uh, contradict my friend. William Morris, the founder of the English arts and crafts movement, famously said, have nothing in your houses you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful. His Oxford mentor, John Ruskin, maintained that to be beautiful, any building, any image had to have a flaw. For that, I was grateful since I've got lots of those, so there's hope. Anyway, it couldn't be perfect. Maybe that explains and anteaters and hedgehogs, or some of the fashion we see sometimes. Whatever beauty is, it is not perfection, at least not in this world. Let's back into it. Outspoken art critic Dave Hickey has never balked at using the word beauty, even for the past few decades when it has been out of style. 
In The Invisible Dragon, Four Essays on Beauty, he writes, beauty is not a thing. The beautiful is a thing. In images, beauty is the agency that causes visual pleasure in the beholder. And since pleasure is the true occasion for looking at anything, any theory of images that is not grounded in the pleasure of the beholder begs the question of art's efficacy and dooms itself to inconsequence. So one very simple reason beauty matters is that it gives us humans pleasure. In C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters, the master devil, screw tape, tells his young protege, Wormwood, that only God, the enemy, can make pleasures. Satan, their father below, has tried and tried and he just can't do it. Pleasure is God's domain. The best devils can do is to pervert pleasure. The Bible reminds us, though, that this can be a two-edged sword. One of the reasons Eve in the garden convinces herself to believe the serpent's lie, that eating the forbidden fruit will not cause her to die, is that it is pleasing to the eye. It is a whole different speech to explain the many abuses of beauty. Read my book. There's a whole chapter, um, but it isn't out yet, so there you are. Anyway, from Caesar Augustus, rebuilding Rome to legitimize his empire, to Adolf Hitler stealing the great art of Europe to adorn his Reich. But it is enough for us today to remember that anything so good can be turned to evil. In Ezekiel 16, the prophet describes how God took Jerusalem from a cast-off newborn to a beautiful human being. But what did Jerusalem do? Her people, quote, trusted in their beauty and played the whore because of their renown. In other words, they let it go to their head. Instead of beauty being an attribute and a gift of God to draw people to their creator and to celebrate life, they took that beauty for granted as a possession. It became an instrument and used it to hold power over others. Perhaps this has its roots in the serpent's abuse of beauty to attempt Eve to believe his lie. Beyond pleasure, as Hickey said, Another reason beauty matters right off the bat is that it points to justice. Every year, my husband and I retreat to the big island of Hawaii to rest, read, and regroup. We stay at the same place, know the people, know the walks. Every evening we watch as beauty brings all the activity of the day to the hall. Half an hour before sundown, people gather at the main beach, old people, babies, toddlers, middle-aged, honeymooning couples, teenagers. They all stop. All eyes look west for 30 minutes, maybe less. Why? The sun is setting. Glory. God made the rising and the setting of the sun to praise him, says the psalmist. That beauty stops everyone in their tracks. And that, according to Elaine Scarry, author of the 1999 book on beauty and being just, is the justice that beauty offers. For the sunset belongs to rich and poor, weak and strong. Every race, every disability, every idiosyncrasy, every religious belief, all are welcome. The sunset and the sunrise are for all. Justice. California poet laureate and former chairman of the US Endowment for the Arts, Dana Joya, says that the experience of beauty can be divided into four stages. First, arrested attention. We have to look, to linger over what we have seen or heard or read. We stop. Second, a thrill of pleasure, an unusual thrill out of proportion to the object's immediate importance. It's bigger, deeper beyond, than we are. It's beyond us. Third, a heightened perception of the depth or meaning of things. We understand something we didn't before, even if we can't articulate it. We are more than we were before the encounter. And finally, it's over. The moment is gone. We can remember it, look back on it, but we can't hold on to the thrill. We can't manufacture it somehow. I had an unexpected experience to, uh, opportunity to experience that process in Lithuania a few years ago a country I've come to love. My husband and I, both Scandinavians, drove all the way around the Baltic Sea. My husband paddleboarded at various 
spots with his inflatable paddleboard. <laughs> Never mind. Anyway, um, we, we started and ended in Copenhagen, and half of the trunk was taken up with this huge orn thing with the inflatable paddleboard. Anyway. Um, I thought it was for luggage, but never mind. Anyway, on that journey, Lithuania was perhaps my biggest surprise. I, I just didn't know what to expect. It's a Catholic country sandwiched between Orthodox Russia and Lutheran Latvia, and for many uh, centuries, Eastern Germany, which is also largely Lutheran. On the way to Vilnius, the capital, out in a field far from any town, there's a hill of crosses with origins stretching back over several centuries. I mean, in the middle of nowhere, this is. Clearly, those crosses were a tangible way for often beleaguered Catholics to bear witness to their faith. Under 18th and 19th century Russification, the Orthodox Russians would take the crosses down and the Lithuanians would put them back up. Then came World War I, when the Germans took them down and the Lithuanians put them back up. Then 21 years of independence gave everybody a break until the Nazis came, and they took the crosses down and the Lithuanians put them back up, and they were followed by the Soviets, and you get the picture, this process continues. Finally, the Soviets just gave up. It was, you know, it was okay, enough, you know, we have enough worries to uh, mess with the crosses. So the, Lith the Lithuanians were just too persistent. And since the Berlin Wall came down, which is now nearly 30 years ago, the country is independent and the crosses arise without threat, at least for now. Pope John Paul II put one there, as did the Armenians in 2001 on the 1700th anniversary of their country becoming Christian. We didn't know what to expect. I thought it would be interesting. That was an understatement. It's a long walk to the hill. Stretching out on either side are all kinds of crosses, wood, metal, real works of art, but humble cobblings put together with God knows what, shrines, stone, you name it. As I started to walk up the hill, I realized tears were streaming down my face. I didn't even know I was weeping until I felt the hot tears. I was in beauty, the beauty of this tangible witness to inimitable faith. So another reason why beauty, whether it is Plato's perfection of proportion or Cicero's decorum, matters is that it breaks through our defenses and gives us perspective. One example, an artist friend in Edinburgh meets regularly with another artist friend who, isn't a, who doesn't believe there's a god. Not long after Sacred Made Real, an exhibition of 17th century Spanish polychrome sculptures and paintings of Christ at the National Gallery in London, the two talked about the last time either of them had cried. The non-believing friend immediately said, when I saw the images in Sacred Made Real. Hickey says that beauty should change the viewer, and that show changed that young man. That shift can lead to yet another reason beauty matters. It's power to convict us of our own shortcomings. In a vision described in Ezekiel 43, the prophet has seen the temple, the dwelling of God himself in great and excruciating at times detail. God speaks, son of man, describe the temple to the people of Israel that they may be ashamed of their sins. God's beauty enables us to see ourselves in sharp contrast. Something about seeing that temple and hearing its description would point up to people their lack of beauty. In accord with Hickey's claim that beauty should change the viewer, Emeritus Pope Benedict XVI put it this way, beauty pulls us up short, but in so doing it reminds us of our final destiny. It sets us back on our path, fills us with new hope, gives us the courage to live to the full the unique gift of life. That new hope then gives us the courage to stop the direction we are going and change our lives. Let's take this example from American author William Faulkner's 1939 short story, Barn Burning. 
There's 10-year-old Colonel Sartorius Snopes. I love that name, Colonel Sartorius Snopes. Um, he turns in Abner, his abusive fa and arsonist father, because for the first time in his life, Colonel Sartorius has seen beauty. Where? In the home of Major de Spain, the man his father is working for, and whose barn eventually his father plans to burn down. The lane to the house is lined with oaks and cedars and other flowering trees. The fence is, quote, masked with honeysuckle and Cherokee roses. The home itself is beautiful. The people treat each other with love and respect. Shocked at this vision of something Colonel Sartoris has never experienced, he longs for it so much that he's willing to break the cycle of abuse and turn his father in. Beauty gives him hope. As Colonel Sartoris stands behind, beside his father, he thinks, it's as big as a courthouse. They are safe from him. People whose lives are a part of this peace, Colonel Despain's home, of this peace and dignity are beyond his touch. Of course, that's just a story set in, in the deep American South 30 years after the Civil War but could beauty make a difference in any real place and time? Let's take a look. The beauty and grandeur of ancient Egypt's monuments is undeniable. Images from tomb paintings, such as this one near just north of Aswan, give us glimpses of ancient life. But most famous of all is the temple at Abu Simbel and the pyramids of Giza. Fewer than 20 miles away, men, women, and children make their living sorting garbage. Of Coptic Christian background, these people, targets for radical Muslim attacks during and since the Egyptian revolution in 2011, sort garbage because Muslims are not allowed to touch it. According to United Nations statistics, almost one third of Egypt's 90.2 million people live below the poverty line, with a national literacy rate of 74% for those over 15. Fail twice in school, and you're out until you pass a literacy test. Alcohol, drugs, and physical and sexual abuse are endemic. Given that background, the prospects for these children are not great. Still, that isn't the whole story. More than 30 years ago, a Coptic priest named Abu Saman came to the city to start a church and help the people. Today, his rock church, literally carved out of the rock at the top of the garbage city hill, has some 15,000 members as well as conference facilities, a medical clinic for both Muslim and Coptic patients, which served both communities during post-revolution attacks, and walls covered with carvings by a Polish volunteer. Then about 25 years ago, a middle-class Coptic woman, Mama Maggie Gobron, also got involved. Today, her Stevens Children Ministry has a staff of more than 1,200, reaching 24,000 families up and down the Nile Valley. The work includes medical clinics, elementary schools, vocational training centers, which teach weaving and shoemaking, literacy classes, weekly home visits, and camps. Like the house that inspired Colonel Sartoris Snopes, these centers, havens of peace, dignity, and beauty, give those who come hope and courage to go forward. Mama Maggie gives a talk, which I heard her give, although it was in Arabic, so it had to be translated for me, um, to young girls um, at the summer at their camp, explaining to them that if they've been abused and, um, and, and sexually or, or, or beaten, um, that that isn't who they are. Uh, who they are is whole, they're whole in Jesus Christ, and all that is washed away. That isn't who they are. And, and after she gives them that talk, she gives them practical ways to, be, to avoid being abused, like if uncle so-and-so is coming over, you can do these three things. So it's, uh, it's both an inspiration and practical advice. But still, that isn't the whole story. No, there's down here. These are examples of the power of beauty to transform lives, tangible. In an essay called Beauty in the Light of Redemption, 20th century Roman Catholic philosopher Dietrich von Hildebrand pointed out that many Christians question the value of beauty, of the beauty of things we see from sunsets, star-studded night skies, and desert abstraction to great works of art, architecture, and design for two reasons. For one, 
They argued that this beauty of form, as von Hildebrand calls it, is a luxury. Not bad in itself, but something extra, added on, certainly not central to our salvation. Christians should apply themselves to great economic and social ills, not spend their energy and resources on trifles like beauty. For another, beautiful things, even sunsets, one wonders, can be a distraction, taking us away from the more important pursuit of godliness and God himself. Von Hildebrand isn't buying it. He says, this utilitarian, and you gotta forgive him for being a philosopher, okay, this is his quote. This utilitarianism is by no means the spirit of the gospel. An estimate of all things from the viewpoint of their practical and absolute necessity is to be found neither in God's creation or the revelation of Christ. In these, on the contrary, the principle of superabundance rules is God not lavish in his creation? Is beauty in nature not the clearest proof that this divine profusion, since it is in no way practically indispensable in the economy of nature? I mean, the sunset doesn't have to be beautiful. And John Calvin said that one of the reasons he believed in God was pears, which is an odd thing to say even for a French reformer living in Switzerland. Um, why? Because we don't need pears. We have apples. We don't need pears. What do we need pears for? We've got apples. Apples provide the nutrients that pears provide. But that's who God is. God thought we needed pears too. Because they're cuter, actually, all yellow and shaped like a pear. I mean, you know, so we needed pears. No, we don't need pears. But God gave us pears anyway. Superabundance who God is. Not only may that beauty in nature, but may that, pardon me, not only may that beauty be in nature, but it also may be in art or music or ceremony or architecture or in the face of a friend. It matters because it bears witness to the reality of God. One example is the famous church of Hagia Sophia built in Constantinople from 332 to 337, five, just five years. It was built by the Byzantine Emperor Justinian, who was a controversial fellow. For more than 900 years, it was the greatest church in Christendom, a witness to the glory and grandeur of God. And it was convincing. In fact, the glory of Hagia Sophia was so great, it convinced the Russian Prince Vladimir to convert to Christianity. Looking more for a more satisfying religion, Vladimir sent envoys to his longtime trading partners in the Byzantine capital. As the Russian primary chronicle records, the beauty of Hagia Sophia was the deciding factor in their recommendation to convert to orthodoxy. Quote, we knew not whether we were in heaven or on earth. For on earth, there is no such splendor or such beauty. And we are at a loss how to describe it. We know only that God dwells there among men, and their service is fairer than the ceremonies of other nations. We cannot forget that beauty. Closer to home, there is evidence the his, that the historic churches of England are drawing at least part of a new generation to Christ. In the June 17, 2017 London Telegraph, Reporter Olivia Rudgard reported the results of a survey that shows not only that 21% of young people in Britain between the ages of 11 and 18 describe themselves as practicing Christians, but also that 13% say they decided to become Christians after visiting a church or a cathedral. The Church of England's National Youth Evangelism leader at the time, Jimmy Dale, said the results of the study commissioned by the Christian youth organization Hope Revolution Partnership and carried out by ComRes shocked him and his team. But John Inge, Bishop of Worcester, I'm going to interview him because I wanted to put this in my book and when I go home I have an interview set up with him. Um, and he's also the lead Anglican bishop for churches and church buildings, told the Telegraph, this shows the power of church buildings. Who thought? They give the sense that the Christian faith has inspired people to build these extraordinary buildings. 
In the 19th century, at the end of his novel, The Idiot, Fyodor Dostoevsky put these words in the mouth of the prince. I believe the world will be saved by beauty. By that, he was pointing to the beauty of Jesus Christ and the redemption we have only through him. How does beauty save the world? Once again, Emeritus Pope Benedict explains, the only really effective apologia for Christianity comes down to two arguments, namely, the saints the church has produced and the art which has grown in her womb. Christians must not be too easily satisfied. They must make their church into a place where beauty, and hence truth, is at home. Without this, the world will become the first circle of hell. Finally, beauty matters because it tells us where we're headed. It points to the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and earth, and it points to what we will become for eternity. The theologians, opticians, architects, and builders who gave us Hagia Sophia understood their church to be an outpost, an embassy of the kingdom of God, of the new heaven and new earth, to be fully realized when Jesus returns. That was one reason it had to be so beautiful inside. It was a witness, a promise. When you were there, you were on the ground of your true citizenship. Before the year 1000, many churches in this tradition depicted the New Jerusalem on the arch over the altar in glittering mosaics you see here in the 9th century Santa Presida in Rome. In others, the Last Judgment and Christ in eternal glory were above the door as you walked out, as you see here in Santa Maria Assunta on the, Torce on the Venice Lagoon in Torcello. This image comes from Revelation 21. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light shall the nations walk, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it. We also long to dwell in that beauty. The Eastern tr Christian tradition has long understood this, and Hagia Sophia is a prime example. The church functioned as what Alexei Lidov, director of the world, of the Center for World Culture at Moscow State University, describes as a spatial icon. That is a space where the art, the architecture, all the decoration, the music, the incense, the feel of the wall marble, the liturgy of the service, the people in procession, all work together as one entity. Each person there is not merely seeing beautiful things. He or she is inside them. My favorite example, though, is the cathedral in Naumburg, Germany. Who knew? The original church, I only found out about it because Howard and I spent eight weeks going through eastern and southern Germany a few years back. And we had a plan. Howard had planned it, and he plans really well, going by history mostly. But I'm reading the guidebook, and I read about this church. So I don't believe in mourning as something you should see of your own free will. So in order to go there and then get to where we were going to have a place to stay, because we always have that arranged, I had, I had to get up like at 6 o'clock in the morning, and we had to leave and drive off up there. So we, I was ready, and we, so off to Nuremberg we went, and, uh, and this experience happened. So come with me now. Step into the nave. The choir to the east, to the west, a stone screen with brilliant red light filtering through. Read the story in stone. The Last Supper. Judas taking the silver. His face, a portrait of despair. The treacherous kiss in Gethsemane. Peter's sword severing the servant's ear from his head. Christ before Pilate. Terror in the governor's eyes. The flogging. Christ struggling on the road to Calvary. Front and center, the cross. The doorpost. This may come from the 4th century commentary by the African Taconius, who describes Christ as the gateway to heaven. Above, you see Christ's bleeding arms forming the lintels of the door. Mary is in agony to your left. Grieving John is to your right. Take a step, another, and another. Walk through the cross with me. Blink your eyes. Ahead is light. Just above, the founders of the church stand poised to step down to welcome you. 
Beyond the altar in radiant red, yellow, blue, green, the prophets, apostles, saints, and virtues call out. Higher still, the Trinity in Christy glory. All welcome you into glory, into heaven, into the realm of your eternal citizenship, the New Jerusalem. When Eve succumbed to the serpent's lie and used the beauty of the fruit as one excuse to disobey God, appearance and reality were separated, perhaps an effect of that fall. Appearances are deceiving from then on. Jacob passes for Esau. David is a boy who is, fit, who is braver than most men. The Son of God had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. What you see is not what you get. But the new Jerusalem will look beautiful, and it will be beautiful. What you see will, at last, be what you get. But the beauty will not end with what we can see. It goes much deeper. It will be what we are. The Bible tells us we become what we worship. Psalm 135. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, made by the hands of men. They have mouths, but cannot speak. Eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear. Nor is there breath in their mouths. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. During the first great awakening in New England, Jonathan Edwards, then, pa then a pastor, wrote a book called Religious Affections to help Christians sort out which feelings, emotions, experiences were truly of God and which were not. The Puritan divine claims that our love for God is genuine, only if we are drawn to him for his beauty and not for how he can benefit us. He wrote, the basis for true delight that a real Christian has is in God and his perfection. His delight is in Christ and his beauty. If we delight in Christ's beauty, the next step is for us to become beautiful as well, not just to see, but to be beauty. In his first letter, John, the beloved disciple, tells us how it will happen. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Finally, our moments of being in beauty rather than its outside observers will become our everlasting experience. The abuse of beauty that began in the garden when Eve yielded to the temptation to disobey God because the fruit was pleasing to the eye will be over. We will live forever in tangible beauty inside and out. Psalm 27 puts it this way. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. All of this is why beauty matters. Beauty is what we were born for. It is the goal of our striving, our reward when we reach home, the source of all delight, the hope of the world, and the eternal glory of God. Thank you.